So, and thank you very much for joining us today. So today we will be hearing from, from the ambassador who will be delivering a lecture on the war in Ukraine, a Belgian perspective. As the ambassador of Belgium, Jean Arthur Rejabou represents His Majesty the King of the Belgians and Belgium's federal government in the United States and the Commonwealth of the Bahamas. He is responsible for the direction of the embassy and its consulates. Upon completion of his studying law, international law and international relations in Belgium, the Netherlands and Italy, he became, it became his career in, he began his career in the banking field in New York City. And as a fellow New Yorker, welcome. After working in the private sector and in, as a legal advisor, the ambassador joined the Belgian Ministry of Foreign Affairs. There he served as a diplomatic advisor to the Minister of Defense and went on to become the first secretary at the Belgium Embassy in Berlin. Subsequently, the ambassador returned to Brussels to be the head of the private office of the Minister of Defense. And in 2007, he was appointed the Director General in charge of the multilateral organizations at the Foreign Ministry. In this capacity, he managed the Belgian presidency of the European Union. In 2016, he took up the role as ambassador to the Russian Federation, Armenia, Belarus, and Uzbekistan. With that, please welcome the ambassador. Thank you so much. So um, thank you for um, the, the privilege of being invited by, by your institute. Uh, maybe just a few more words uh, to explain actually why I'm here. And then I will move on to, to discuss the, the hot topic of the day, which is Ukraine. Uh, because things in life rarely happen by uh, chance. Um, so I will talk about security issues, uh, of course, from a civilian, from a political point of view. I'm very happy to have also the Belgian defense attaché in the room. So if I make any mistake in the military field, so feel free to, to, to correct me. Even so, if I worked seven years for the defense minister, uh, my, my life is more on the diplomatic and the political side. Um, so things do not happen by chance. Um, and uh, why am I a diplomat and why did I come to serve the defense minister? There is a reason for that, there is history. And um, to, to explain this history, I have to mention my father. My father uh, was a partisan in World War II. Um, he was the son of a worker, himself a, a, a social democrat, uh, but really opposed to fascism. And you know, I speak of the, 30, the 1930s, so being opposed to fascism was one of the big things of the day. And when um, the war, uh, the, the Second World War finished for Belgium, in what we, we named the campaign of the 18 days, that was the number of days our army uh, was uh, able to resist a German um, a Nazi uh, invasion, uh, my father decided, I cannot accept it, and I will keep my weapon, and I will fight as a partisan. And he did it so uh, successfully for about two years, helping, for example, gathering information or uh, um, the, the, uh, the pilots, the Allied pilots who had been down over Belgium to, to help them escape uh, back to the free zone in France, back to Britain. But unfortunately, he was caught by the Gestapo uh, in 1942. And so he spent um, the next three years in Nazi jails, first in Belgium, but also in concentration camps uh, in, in Germany. And the big thing is that he survived these three years, which is the amazing thing, because when he came back from uh, the Dasha, which was the last camp, the doctor told him, uh, well, your weight is 33 kilo, and I think that you have six months to live. And actually, he, he managed to live on for 34 years, and I was born in 1962. So I'm a kind of the son of a miracle, right? And something which is uh, a strong link for me, uh, unsurprisingly, that when my father was in Dachau on 27th of April, 1945, he was liberated by the seven US Army. And so you can imagine what it means to me to be representing my country now in the United States. Had it not been for the presence of American soldiers in Europe, I would simply not be in front of you. 
but also um, my father all the, the rest of his life because this experience was the experience of the life. Um, he always decided to fight for dignity, human dignity and freedom. That was the master word for him. And so, for example, in the 1960s and 70s, he would condemn Boss, the assassination of opponents by Pinochet in Chile, but also the Gulag on the Soviet Union. For him, Boss were not acceptable. And also, he had sometimes a sense of provocation. He participated in a worldwide congress of veterans of World War II, um, and for example, he visited Poland, I think it was in 1967, at the time, of course, occupied by uh, the, the Soviet army. And he delivered his speech in French because he was not good at foreign languages, but at the very end of his speech, he had been told a, free, uh, a few uh, words in Polish. And he said in Polish for the whole audience, long live to free Poland. And after that, he was barred from entering the Soviet Union, unsurprisingly. But that is to show that when you have such a father, you cannot escape the, the question of security. And uh, in my use uh, as a student, I decided around the age of 20 that I would specialize in international affairs. And the most important aspect of international affairs is security. First of all, if you want to uh, discuss any other issue, you have first to make sure that you're secure to do what you want to do. So uh, surprisingly, I went on to uh, study um, international relations, also at Johns Hopkins in Bologna Center, not here on Massachusetts Avenue. And I was hired at some point after just uh, becoming a diplomat as a security advisor to the, the defense minister. I was seven years over there, and that was just a great experience, not just in the field of security, but also in the interaction between politics and security, because um, for example, the job of the military is to deliver the means to guarantee this security. The job on the politicians, on the other end, is to make sure that we do have the necessary means to feed the, the means for security and that we nurture public acceptance, that we translate the public opinion into a policy. Um, and that is a, a very important factor uh, in Belgium. Let me just also sketch a few words about Belgian security policy uh, in, in broad terms. Um, Belgium, as you know, is a tiny country between France and Germany. And then we have uh, Britain just across the channel, the Netherlands to the north. Uh, but you know that for centuries, literally, France and Germany fought each other. <clears throat> and most of their fighting happened where? Right in the middle, which means on Belgian territory. So I, I, I'm used to say, we in Belgium, we know what war means. Maybe not my generation, but the generations of my parents and before, yes, we do know. And it's still very present in the collective memory in, uh, in, uh, of the Belgian people. And so I, I dare to say that we actually are rather pacifist people. We don't like war, uh, but when it is necessary, we fight. And that was a decision taken by our government, both in 1914 and in 1939. And, and 40, when the German Empire decided to attack France just going through Belgium. So we have um, a tradition of uh, resistance to any type of invasion. Um, but we were also very happy after 1945 that the French and the Germans realized that uh, their endless fighting was futile. And that actually, uh, in realistic terms, um, they had both been heavily defeated in World War II, right? So they decided now it's better not to fight each other anymore and to cooperate. And that was the start of your, the European uh, integration process. So um, if you just want to, to name a, a few important battles that we know happened in Belgium, well, just speak of Waterloo, that's 15 kilometers south of Brussels. Uh, in the First World War, Flanders Fields or in the Second World War, the Battle of the Bilge, that we still celebrate with veterans nowadays here in, in Washington, in Arlington. Uh, and we saw it all um, this sacrifice from American soldiers around Bastogne, for example, and I come from, my family comes more or less from, from the region. Uh, what, who knows what would uh, have happened? So we decided that uh, after having tried neutrality, it did not work because we were invaded by Germany anyway. We decided, well, now we should try something else. 
and that was first the European Union, European integration, which was there with a double objective, first to secure peace, with the idea that we should no longer have the means to fight each other among member states. But second, also, uh, Belgium is a founding member of NATO. And contrary to what some people uh, believe, NATO has not been established at the wish of the United States. It was a wish of the Europeans of the time. 1947, 48, blockade of Berlin. And uh, there is a famous statement by the Belgian foreign, foreign minister of the time, Paul Henri Spack, who said in French, nous avons peur, we are scared. And why was that? Because the Allies on the Western Front had just withdrawn all their troops, among them mainly Americans, but also the Brits. They were back to Britain. Whereas the Soviet Union had maintained its troops in the eastern part of Europe. And so there was a heavy military imbalance. And the fear in Western Europe in many countries was that Stalin would use these troops, not just to stop in the middle of Germany, but to go even further. And that was the reason for the birth of NATO. And Belgium, as you know, uh, um, today hosts uh, NATO in, in Brussels. So there is something um, a bit peculiar about the nature of Belgian security policy. On the one hand, we're deeply pacifist. We do not like war, but we also know the price we paid in history. And so we are very satisfied with the current arrangement we have, both with European uh, member states uh, in the EU and the NATO alliance, including the United States and Canada from North America. Now, let me uh, tell you a few words about Ukraine. And I think I can summarize um, our, the, the feeling of many people by saying that we might all be surprised by the level of unity that has been shown by the Western countries uh, since the start of the war. That is true both for the European Union and for NATO. Um, we're surprised because I can tell you frankly, because I'm sometimes part of the discussion, there is almost zero difference among the member states in both organizations. Of course, we might uh, um, have some nuances about what it exactly means, victory in this war. Uh, but on, on the basic, what we are fighting for, what, why we want to support Ukraine in this war, it's so easy to understand and so obvious to all of us. And uh, a, a marked aspect, and that's, that's Belgium, but that's true throughout Europe, is that there is almost zero political debate about support for Ukraine in my country. It's so obvious that Ukraine has been aggressed by uh, an empire next door, and this war, first, uh, it's not right, but second, we also need for our own security interest, Ukraine to win this one. Because if it does not, what's the next step? So everybody in Belgium, even those who have no particular education in security policy, they instinctively understand why this is so important. Um, a good example also is the welcoming of refugees from Ukraine. Migration is always, um, a very difficult political debate in everywhere, including in the United States, also in Belgium, but not about Ukrainian refugees. The issue is, okay, where are we going to find the necessary housing for them? Not if they are welcome or not, they are welcome. The real issue we have right now, it's actually a consequence of the war, not the principle of supporting Ukraine, but the price for energy. You know more or less the context, we can go deeper into that if you want uh, during the debate, um, but it has had a consequences about the price of energy. And then that is difficult to bear for uh, quite a significant number of our citizens and our companies. And across Europe, you, fi you find more or less the same reaction. It is for the government to try to compensate maybe not the full extent of the increase, but to make it bearable for everyone. And after one year of uh, implementing such a policy, I would not say that everything is fine, but we've been largely successful in diffusing the energy crisis, which does not mean that it is over yet. We still have to work uh, on it, but it's also one aspect of the transatlantic relationship is that talks between the European Union, Union and the United States was a big element in diffusing this part of the crisis. 
Now, um, as, as a former uh, ambassador to, to Russia, I would just like to add a, a few elements about that dimension. Um, because in particular from that angle, this war is so sad for me. First, because I do have uh, Russian friends, and you know these Russian friends are not necessarily uh, big supporters of the current leader, uh, but they, all, they will also bear the consequences. Probably not now, uh, because the Kremlin is wise enough in managing its democracy. You know, that's a special word they use in, in the Kremlin. It's a managed democracy, not a real democracy. Um, they, they know how not to excite too, uh, too much the, the sensitive political centers like Moscow or St. Petersburg. So just an example, when they mobilize um, uh, the youth uh, to be soldiers, they would rather pick up the soldiers in faraway regions, be it in the east, in the southeast, etc., rather than the youth in Moscow, because they want to avoid political protest in the heavy, uh, politically important centers. Um, now, um, it's clear to me also that what I witnessed when I was in Russia, there was um, a, a, a friendly element, but also a non-friendly element. Uh, the friendly element is that I, I discovered that the Russian citizen, the average citizen, is much more open and friendly than what I had expected from what I had read. Um, they are very similar to us, except in one important respect, and it is their political culture. So when they speak of a political system, they are just on another planet. If I can uh, summarize, we are used uh, in our political system to a kind of check and balances, so that even a strong leader, a very popular leader, has limits on what he or she can achieve or realize. At some moment, there is a limit. And more, most of the time, it's based on our constitutional principles. In Russia, there exists also a constitution, in principle, um, but the way the political system works is totally different. If I can uh, make this comparison, I would uh, compare it to uh, a, a dictator from the Roman times. When Rome was in danger, the Senate in Rome elected the dictator for one year so that there would be one leader to guarantee the security of Rome. But at the end of the year, this dictator was gone if the threat was gone. In Russia, no. The dictator is there for life, more or less, um, but with the same time of power. And in exchange, the social contract is he will be the overall boss to guarantee the security of the community. And that's a, a big difference in Russian societies that comes from the Middle Ages. It does not come from the Soviet Union. I would rather argue that the Soviet Union was the perfect successor to the Tsarist system. They just replaced God by Karl Marx. Uh, but the political principles remain the same. And um, that's also why it is so important for Vladimir Putin to insist that actually it's not Russia that aggressed Ukraine, but the West that aggressed Russia. He needs this, um, this type of speech to convince the Russian people to follow him. Otherwise, it would simply not work. Uh, and so I think that it's a big part of our task also to demonstrate that he's wrong, he's wrong to attack, he's wrong to use this type of propaganda, and that in, in the end, it, you will just lose that fight. So even from a very pacifist country with our own experience of war, it's very easy for us. It's not, it was not even a question in a matter of days. We uh, decided together with our partners of the European Union uh, to decide on sanctions uh, against uh, Russia and to support Ukraine. I must say that a big part in, in my own analysis, a big part of the big support you will find for Ukraine across Europe, you know, even a neutral country like Switzerland. And I know the country because my mother was Swiss, I'm also a Swiss citizen. Um, a big part of the support for Ukrainians come from the Ukrainians themselves, i.e. the courage, the resilience they've shown since the start of the conflict, the willingness to resist aggression. I think that it inspired the rest of the people in the continent to support them just because they deserve it. So I will stop here as an introduction, and I'm really uh, interested in listening to your comment and question. Thank you. Hey, Ambassador, uh, perhaps we'll open it to questions, but I, I cannot help myself to share this with you and the audience. It turns out we have a lot in common to be grateful for, 
freedom, our lives, freedom, and our gratefulness to our country, the United States of America. My grandparents were taken as slave labor in World War I to Germany. They survived. Then those same grandparents were adults. And my grandparents, my father, my aunts, my uncles, every member of my family fought in the Warsaw Uprising, in the resistance, and they were subsequently taken to concentration camps. The women to Ravensburg, the men to Schaffhausen and Flossenburg. Before they were taken to the camps, my grandparents and my father were instrumental in saving Jews from certain death for which they're recognized in Israel by the Hashem as righteous Gentiles. They all survived, and they survived, why? From the concentration camps? Because they were liberated by General Patton's army. So we share a lot in common and a lot to be thankful to the United States and to everyone who is here. So we share a lot in common of why we are diplomats and what patriotism and freedom our parents instilled in us, and we're hoping to instill it into the next generation and into the students that are here at IWP. Thank so, you. Uh, with that, why don't we open up for questions? Um, we have a microphone right here. Thank you, Ambassador, for a very uh, lovely talk. Uh, my question is not so much on the conduct of the war, but the but what happened, uh, or what did not happen in the years, indeed decades, prior to the war? Why was the world surprised on the 24th of February about Russian invasion? Do you have any indication of any kind of uh, movement or assurances given by the NATO countries, particularly the United States, as to what would happen? If Putin invaded Ukraine, they had decades to warn that country about the possibility. Do you have any indication that anything was done? Because that was the causation of the war. Basically, in my own ignorance, I consider it absence of any kind of indication. And I think that is the fault of the Western allies. But I'm not sure. Would you please comment on Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. So I'm not privy to any secret in that respect. I'm just uh, an observer and I try to understand what I, what I see. What I can see both from my knowledge of, of NATO and Russia, <clears throat> that there were deep misunderstanding on both sides. And a typical mistake in international relations is that you project on the other side your own criteria. And so for example, as we never intended to invade Russia, well, we expect Russia to have the same attitude. Uh, as we pursue human rights, we deeply believe it's a fundamental value, as I mentioned, human dignity, right? For my father, it was central. Uh, but the, the Russians have another way of looking at it. So for example, when you speak of human rights, um, they, they would uh, tell you, well, actually, you're only defending your interest. Uh, if the people uh, in Ukraine want to have freedom, it's because they are being manipulated by the CIA. So it's just another way of looking at the world. And I think that we are both responsible in that respect. Mistakes were made on both sides, both the West and the Russian side. If, if uh, I, I can just make uh, two, two examples of mistakes I believe we made in the West. Uh, first, um, the, the way we botched the uh, proposal to, to Ukraine and Georgia to join NATO. Uh, it was proposed by the U.S. administration barely three weeks be before the NATO summit in Bucharest, and I was there. And then, it, it, surprisingly, we had no consensus. You know, three weeks for such a, 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 a dramatic strategic change, you cannot do it. You need at least six months, if not 12 months, just to make sure that you have a real consensus. Because NATO is, is, is a really a democratic organization, and it does work by consensus. And this consensus was simply not present. So, uh, and we ended up with a ver the, the worst possible uh, outcome. We, we told the Ukrainians, you're going to be a member of NATO, but we don't know when. It might be tomorrow or in 3,000 years, uh, which is the opposite of providing uh, security, in my view. Uh, another mistake that was made suddenly on our side 
uh, was the way um, the UN Security Council resolution on, on Libya was botched in 2011. It was told to the, um, the, the Russians, okay, if you authorize this resolution, which was really far reaching, you know, you have a Security Council resolution saying that all the necessary means will be permitted to prevent the killing of civilians in, in, in Libya. All the necessary means. But the Russians were told by Europeans, okay, but we agree that it will not lead to regime change. And then it did. And then the Russians said, and, and keep repeating to us, you lied to us, we cannot trust you. So there was this type of misunderstanding on both sides because the Russians, they were no better in many examples and I could give a whole list. So I think that one major point. The second point is um, in the months leading to the war, um, it, it's a public element that the, the CIA director, William Byrne, visited Moscow in November of 2021. And that was the time when uh, the US intelligence made public the, the fact that there were uh, Russian troops all around the border uh, of Ukraine and that there was a real uh, a serious danger of invasion, right? And my understanding, but I, I was not there, of course, and I have no privileged access. My understanding is that Mr. Burns, who has a very good access to the US president, clearly told the Russians, be aware of the consequences if you do that. And in my view, that's one more misperception than on the Russian side, Putin simply did not believe it. He believed that the West was utterly divided, that the US president was weak, that Europeans would not resist an energy crisis, would be flooded by refugees, and they would have not, not the will to, to fight, and the Ukrainians even less, because in Putin's mind, Ukrainians are Russians who ignore themselves. Is it, the, the lack of proper intelligence by the FSB on Ukraine is, is just so amazing. You know, I, I never lived in Ukraine, but I visited the country quite a few times, especially Odessa. Odessa is a typically Russian-speaking city. And I went there to, to, to learn some Russian. And I was hosted by a Russian-speaking family. And it was back in 2015, after Crimea. Uh, but these uh, Russian-speaking Ukrainians were so clear with me that they never wanted to be governed from Moscow. They are Ukrainian citizen and happy Ukrainian citizen, Russian speaking. And so it, it was obvious uh, from, from my point of view after a few visits to Ukraine that even the Russian speakers in Ukraine do not want to be governed from Moscow. And that's something the people in the Kremlin either choose to ignore or simply um, decided it's not possible it once, once more it's American propaganda. So they just ignore facts. Uh, and now uh, I think that the Kremlin has to face one of the most form formidable crises because uh, none of this prediction happened, quite the opposite. And I would say that I, I, in my lifetime, I've never seen the West so united on the single topic. Could you please talk a bit more about managed democracy in Russia? Mm -hmm. So, um, in the 90s, Russia was not a perfect democracy, far from it, but there were at least uh, people in power who believed in the principle of democracy and there were more or less proper elections. They were more or less fair and free, which is no longer the case by far. And so when Putin was designated by Boris Yeltsin to succeed, he inherited also um, a kind of democratic spirit. He needed to convince the people that he would be a good president. But increasingly, um, uh, Putin and the people around him, because we always concentrate on Putin himself, but actually it's quite a circle of people, it's not just one man. Um, they decided that for the sake of Russia, of course, for the sake of stability, as they mention it, they need to, mention, to, to, to manage public opinion. And it means, this, they would not admit, but it's a fact, it means managing the result of election, uh, but it also means managing the public opinion. And, and this they do sometimes very cleverly. Just to give you an example, uh, access to internet. Access to internet is still more or less free in Russia, which is surprising to us, right? Um, because the people in the Kremlin understand that that might be one step too far, and that might provoke a big political backlash against the rulers. So they prefer to use other means. 
Uh, but they give them the possibility to act <coughs> if they believe it's necessary. Also, typically uh, a Russian attitude, they vote laws, <coughs> but they do not necessarily implement these laws. Example related to internet, there is a law in Russia that forbids the use of VPN. Because with the use of VPN, you can circumvent uh, interdictions by the local government, right? But most of the time, this uh, interdiction is not implemented. So that even today, Russian citizens can um, very easily access the BBC or Western media. Um, they have the capacity they, if they decide, but they do not necessarily use it because they don't want to uh, alienate uh, a particular part of the population. Uh, so that's what I call um, the, the, managing, the management of, of democracy. So it's not totally transparent. I would say it's rather the opposite. The system is really opaque. Um, the center of power is the Kremlin, and it is only the Kremlin. So, for example, if you see Mr. Lavrov or Russian diplomats, they are just spokesperson. They do not participate in the, in the decision making. Um, and even for uh, embassy, at least at, uh, for a country like Belgium, it was almost impossible to get any type of meeting inside the Kremlin, where the real decision makers are. So it's, it's a bit in the dark. Um, but on the other end, it's not as systematic as what you, you see in China, uh, in terms of overall control by the state. Um, for most of the period where I was present, there was still some sphere where you could speak freely, right? And you still had some NGOs. Um, as long as you were no danger for political stability, i.e. that there was no risk that uh, Putin would lose the election, you could still speak and even sometimes criticize the government. So there were still a, a, free, a, a really free uh, radio channel, Eko Moskvi, which is now out of, uh, out of business. Um, a relatively few press, uh, even surprisingly, and um, typically Russian NGOs like Memorial. I think Memorial is uh, a badge of honor for Russian culture and Russian citizens. These are people who try to um, uh, find archives about all the victims of Stalinism. Uh, because of course there were people in Eastern Europe mainly who suffered of Stalinism, but first of all the Russians themselves. Millions and millions of people died uh, under Stalin. And so this NGO founded 30 years ago tried to document uh, all um, the people who, who, who died, because all Russians have someone in their family who disappeared as a result. And so the management uh, by the Kremlin was progressively to reduce the freedom that I just mentioned. And clearly, um, just before the start of the war, December 2021, the Kremlin decided now, Memorial, it's enough. It, this uh, organization is dissolved. So, which was um, the, the, the evidence to me that now the worst is coming because they're even afraid of their own people who could criticize the war, that they, they, they have no longer uh, the ability to speak. So that's what I, I described as managed de democracy. Well, first, um, thank you so much for such a wonderful remark, Ambassador. And my question is, um, one of the recent news articles on the Ukrainian war has reported that there has been 16,000 Russians died, Russian so uh, soldiers died in, in, in Ukraine. And it says it will be hard for Putin to cover that up. And I was wondering, what do you, do you think it can affect Putin in terms of maintaining his political support from other oligarchs? Also. Well, uh, first about the oligarchs, they have exactly zero influence. Huh? Uh, that's a big difference between Ukraine and, and Russia. Uh, we, we tended to joke among Western diplomats, uh, in Ukraine, the oligarchs control the, the secret service. In, in Russia, it's the opposite. So um, Putin made very clear at the beginning of his reign 20 years ago, Okay, you have the right to get rich, even by the billions, but don't intervene in politics. And he made a, f uh, a, f a few examples. Uh, one of them uh, was condemned, for example, to uh, 10 years in prison, Kordakovsky, uh, just for, uh, fisc for fiscal or tax reasons, 
but it, of course, this is also part of the managed democracy, right? Everybody is cheating with taxes in, 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 in Russia, and the power will just target the people he wants to make sure that they will no longer be able to be a, 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 a problem. Um, now, the number of, of casualties on, on the battlefield, I would say that at this stage, it, I don't see it as a, as a threat for the stability of the regime in the Kremlin. Uh, but mainly because of what I mentioned, the conscripts, they do not come from cities like Moscow and St. Petersburg. They come from faraway regions and also from minorities. Um, and so th there is not yet um, a, a powerful movement, movement like in, in the Soviet times uh, during the war in Afghanistan of Soviet mothers complaining about the disappearance of their son uh, who were killed in Afghanistan. So even now, there are, uh, the number of Russian casualties is much higher than in, in Afghanistan, but that's also part of the, manage, the political management. Uh, and so uh, many analysts believe that's why there is not a lot of conscript in Moscow, because if the people in Moscow were to revolt against the war because of the high rate of casualties, then the stability of the regime might be at stake. And that's certainly a break, at least, uh, on Russia's ambitions. Yeah, I have a question. Uh, I'm curious what your opinion is on how the war will end. So, I imagine the scenario where the U.S. Is, has a basically a blank check commitment to give money to Ukraine until this ends, and they're starting to give tanks, they're giving stronger weapons as time goes on. And how will Putin manage the reputational disaster of the, of the war not going in his favor, or even if Ukraine takes back territory that is lost? Well, um, you know, that's all about speculation. Uh, in, in policy terms, in current policy terms, I think that the line is uh, just like uh, the US president said, we will support Ukraine as long as it takes. Uh, because for us, um, the, the, the goal is, uh, it's Ukraine's survival. And the fact that we cannot allow um, any, any power in Europe to invade and grab territory from a neighbor. That's the essential principle that is at stake. And I think that as long as it is not achieved and that we cannot find um, a peace agreement with the Ukrainians, uh, so no, nothing about Ukraine without Ukrainians, I think that that is here to stay. Um, now, on the Russian side, uh, I think that uh, it must have come as a nasty surprise to put in that the Ukrainians dare to resist, that they are very efficient in, in the resistance, that they get so much support from the West and that the West is not divided at all and that they could even solve the energy crisis. So I, um, for Putin, this is a particularly difficult moment uh, because indeed at this stage, I do not see how he could uh, um, find a, a, a good end to this war. But also, I think it's a warning for us. It means that we, we sh should not uh, start from the point of view that this is won all over already. No. Putin and the people around him, because they have so much at stake in, in this war, they will keep fighting. And it means that uh, it, it put on us the burden of keeping supporting the Ukrainians. And this also makes me curious because if this war will continue, and Putin knows that, will Putin feel like there's some sort of existential threat to his entire control of the country and to Russia itself, and then he might escalate and even use tactical nukes or something like that? Well, you know, even someone like Putin is, remember, is a man from the KGB. So first, is really used to lying. That's something he does very frequently, uh, most obviously about Crimea in 2014, but also about um, manipulating threat. My reading is that is a uh, frequent quotation less in, in the recent times, but last year, uh, to nuclear escalation is to make us afraid. And I think that the right reaction is to show we are not afraid because too, what is at stake is too important for us and, and not for, you, for the Ukrainians, but also for us. Um, I, I would not exclude uh, um, the nuclear risk by definition, but I would say it's very low. Uh, because even the people in the Kremlin, they do not want to commit suicide. Um, I got a quick, quick question for you. What do you think is the chances that NATO is going to be drawn into this conflict directly? 
whether it's uh, American forces or East you know, Polish forces or whatever, to support Ukraine, especially if the situation does not improve and Russia throws a lot more resources at the problem it has so far. So my analysis as of today is that this chance is very low. Uh, and most likely because simply we don't need it. But also, remember, uh, Ukraine is not covered by Article 5 of NATO, right? We did not give uh, the same security guarantee. But there is still the Memorandum of Budapest, um, which signed in 94 by the Russians, uh, because they all speak uh, of a Western aggression, but they are the ones who are violating all principles they signed themselves. Uh, which said that in exchange for Ukraine giving up uh, nuclear weapons, its guarantee would be guaranteed by uh, security would be guaranteed by uh, Russia, the United Kingdom, and the United States. <clears throat> so now, what are the consequences of this guarantee? It's not that clear, but clearly, it's not as strong as NATO Article Five. Now, I think we, we've been very clear, uh, all of us, um, and if I, if I can quote the Secretary General of NATO, not a single inch of NATO don't touch a single inch because that would launch a reaction. And my feeling has always been that the, the Russian realize they are not a match for NATO. So I do not expect uh, Russian forces to touch a single inch of NATO territory. But indeed, they might increase the pressure on Ukraine. What then, uh, if um, the, the fate of the war was to be reversed, uh, I do not know exactly as of now what our reaction would be, but we would take it very seriously. Um, but I, I, I do consider the chance of NATO being directly involved, i.e. with soldiers on the ground, to be very low. We'll go there. Please. For, for a tool of? For non-violent conflict resolution, and you start like, mm -hmm. um, I, like they don't, would you have it, he threatens us, he face consequences, and everything. I feel like we're living in the paper, there is always, not only, but often violent there. So like, the question is like, is diplomacy, is international diplomacy powerful enough as a tool to prevent future wars in the global crisis? Well, um, before I answer to you, I have to tell you that I belong to the realistic school of international relations. So in my view, all politics, be it domestic or international, is based on the balance of power. And a diplomacy without power is powerless. Uh, that's also why, you see, for example, if I refer once again to my father, um, I do not believe that my father survived because it was mor morally right. It's because um, the Allies were stronger than the Nazis. So there is always an element of power, of force. And, and that's why, um, for me, it was natural to work for the defense ministry. The defense ministry is a kind of guarantee of course, Belgium alone is, is nothing, right? But that's what we learned in, in World War I and World War II, is that we need to have allies. And in this respect, there can be diplomacy. In that respect, uh, and I think that we are right to underline that all the time, that all members of NATO, we have been at peace since we joined NATO, but also because NATO is the most formidable military alliance in history, right? But also NATO, remember, is a defensive alliance. Right? We made it clear from the very beginning, i.e. if you wanted to, to convince the Belgian public that NATO should be used for any type of offense, 
no chance you get a majority in the Belgian parliament, zero. But now that uh, if we had to, to defend, for example, Estonia, because it would be uh, attacked, then you get 90%, 95% of Belgian parliament and population behind it. Uh, and so that's how I, I look at um, uh, using diplomatic tools. Now, I'm also a lawyer by education, but you, you know law can be implemented only if you have someone to decide the rule, sometimes to implement it, and sometimes to judge and punish. And the problem is in international relations, it, it, maybe sometimes you have a judge, but not always. And in any way, you don't have any policemen to enforce except the Security Council. But it means that all big powers have to agree. And in this case, obviously, that's not the case. So we will still have, I'm afraid for a long time to come, to, we'll still have to rely on sheer force to, to protect our interests. In defense, I presume, uh, uh, to, to be clear, in defense. Thank you very much for a wonderful presentation. Uh, I'm the Associate Rector of a Ukrainian University that is still up and running throughout the war. Uh, I'm here because I'm very interested in a couple of points you've made. An earlier point to follow on to this young woman's process about diplomacy. Could you expand on, you said, as you weren't able to get into Moscow, you, the, the certain diplomats are left at arm's length at best. And second of all, the topic of, of propaganda, Russian propaganda has reached uh, to every corner of the world, not just on Ukraine, but on many, many issues. And particularly in this case, uh, so many Europeans uh, seem to be drinking the Kool-Aid, as one says, from the same, mm -hmm. you know, that's this being doled out. And, Particularly, we notice in Germany and other groups where say we don't want to be supporting Ukraine, we want to be supporting Russia. And of course, you have all of Hungary and so on and so on. So, if you could expand on your thoughts on that, I'd appreciate it. Yeah. Well, first, uh, I understand that you speak uh, of people um, even supporting, uh, going as far as supporting Russia in, in Europe. I can assure you, this is a very limited number of people. But of course, they would be used again and again by Russian propaganda. And I, should, I think we should not conceal the fact that these people exist, right? They do exist, but in such a limited number. Um, and for example, even if you look, for example, at uh, Germany, uh, first you have to realize that they, they have a few million people of Russian origin, so who were Germans a few centuries ago. Uh, and, and these people are worked uh, also by Russian propaganda. You have the tradition of the SPD, uh, rather a pacifist um, a party, uh, uh, host politic. And um, I, I, as a Belgian, I think we, 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 we try to understand our German neighbors. We, we, Germany now is a, is a main partner for us. Yeah? It used to invade us, but that was three generations ago. Now it's a main partner. And I understand the need for Olaf Scholz to keep uh, to, to run the, the policy is running because he needs to keep the balance uh, in his own political uh, environment. And I would say that he's rather, first, he's rather successful. And if you look at the, the, the way Germany has undertaken uh, in, in one year, it's remarkable. Uh, it's a total change uh, in attitude towards Russia, energy, uh, defense spending, supporting Ukraine, sending tanks. Um, so you, you might say uh, maybe it was too late. Well, they did it and everything in, t in 12 months. So that is remarkable. Now, um, when it comes to propaganda, I think that sometimes you also have to look at our own plate. Uh, because indeed the Russians uh, are masters at this, but they were also during Soviet times. But for example, when it comes to using social media, uh, they also, uh, uh, studying us much better than we are studying them. Um, and and they, they find on our side many instruments they can exploit. And for example, social media. And social media is about what? Yes, okay, ideally it's about connecting people. But the business model, it's about making money, right? 
And you make money by encouraging people to have more and more assertive, aggressive statements. Because then it will be liked, it will be read, etc., etc. So, so you get more advertising, right? And the Russians, they feed that system, right? So they did not create the social media, but they use some negative aspect of, of social media. And I think that if we were more aware uh, on our side of, because we are not perfect, the, the, the big difference is that as democracies, we know we are not perfect and we know we could perish. But that's what should feed our will um, to, to withstand this type of, of pressure. And I think, uh, above all, that's the strength of freedom. Because having a debate, it will always produce a better solution than the decision of a single man. We have time for one more question. Thank you, Ambassador. Uh, my question is, for companies who have stopped business and left Russia in protest of the war, how does Belgium and other EU countries' governments, individually or collectively, help businesses face challenges to the new situations like the lost costs, inflation, and energy, especially if they consider not returning to Russia in the long term? So there are two very different issues. Um, for the, the businesses in Russia, uh, it depends if they are targeted by sanctions or not. You know, uh, the, the sanctions we decided together, Europeans and Americans, are quite far reaching. And it led indeed to some companies just closing shop. Uh, but in most cases, actually, it was pressure from customers, things that it was no longer the moral thing to do to conduct business in Russia. Uh, for example, as far as I know, there was no obligation for McDonald's to withdraw from Russia. But the pressure from so many of their customers was so strong, they, they, they could not see how they could stay in Russia and not lose so millions of customers over here, right? Um, so I would say that most of these companies, they're on their own because it's part of the, the normal business cycle. Uh, you take a risk, uh, you had a, a much higher uh, margin of profit while operating in Russia, but you also knew in which environment you were operating, right? And uh, there are still some uh, Western companies operating there uh, because they are not targeted by sanctions. Typically, that would be for pharmaceutical industries because we do not want to punish people with, um, uh, what, what's the name in, in, in English, uh, epilepsy uh, in Russia because of, of the failure of their leader, right? So th that type of thing. And um, we'll see how it evolves with time. We, at, at this stage, we do not know. Now, if I consider the... The, the businesses in Belgium and who face the consequences. Well, first, inflation is not only the result of the war. It's the result of COVID, uh, of um, uh, supply chain problems, um, maybe uh, monetary policy, uh, you know, uh, QE. Um, and in addition to all of that, there is the war in Ukraine. Uh, and of course, it's a primary uh, policy target for all our government, I think also for the US administration, to manage the economy in a way that would uh, uh, not lead to, to, to a recession or to an excess of inflation. Um, in Belgium, the, the way we decided uh, to do it is by first, in terms of the general population, people with a salary, they get their salaries automatically increased when there is inflation. So, um, for example, on January 1st, if it is done once in the, in, in the private uh, sector, um, there was a 10% inflation from January 1 to January 1, and uh, millions of people got a 10% increase in their salary. But still, they struggled a bit uh, in between because uh, energy prices went up in July, in August, in September, etc. But it's a way of compensating. Um, Another way is um, just um, uh, sub sub subsidies to uh, uh, citizens or uh, companies according to their needs. And that's a decision taken by government with the approval of parliament, of course, with the idea that the subsidies are clearly temporary. Because on the other end, the policy of the government is to diversify energy sources. Fortunately, a country like Belgium did not depend heavily on, on Russia. Uh, it was just 6% of our total energy mix. Uh, but still, we, we depend on, on market prices, and, and the market prices went up by, by 100 to 200%. Uh, we've decided to keep two nuclear plants open, 
So we had a policy decided upon already 20 years ago to close down all our nuclear plants uh, by 2025. And we do have two green parties in our coalition, right? And um, in a matter of weeks after the start of the war, even the minister from the green parties understood that it could no longer uh, hold uh, that decision. And so the, go the Belgian government decided, well, at least we will keep two of the nuclear plants because we do not want to, to risk um, um, running out of, of power. Uh, and it was zero problem even for, for the Green parties because they are realistic, right? Um, we also decided to increase our investment in off, uh, offshore wind. Uh, we do not have a long coast, only 40 miles, uh, but we, we were building there. We already have the capacity of one or two nuclear plants over there, and we, we decide to multiply it uh, in a matter of years. So that's the type of answer. So it requires a lot of investment. Um, and, and we are running a deficit, uh, clearly, but there is, um, if not 100% support in Parliament, a very broad support for this type of policy. And every European country reacted, uh, I would say, not in the same way, but in similar ways to um, make sure that the consequences of uh, all this economic uh, crisis would not be too damaging for uh, the public and, and business. Please, let's give a round of applause to you guys. Thank you.